Good morning. <laughs> um, I have some announcements. There is no junior church today, so kids stay in here. And then there's J team tonight at 5:30, and there's junior high youth tonight at 5:30. all bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, I uh, ask you to be with us today, and I ask that you be with uh, Mitchell and uh, Jackson as they bring, as they uh, share their message with us, and I um, ask you to be with us today, and I thank you for everyone that put this together, for, and um, thank you for everything you've done. I ask you to be with us the rest of the day, be with J team tonight, in your son's holy name, amen. Amen. Okay. We have some scripture. Psalms 42, 7. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Psalms 46, 1 through 5. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. On 4, 13 through 14, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 7, 38, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Okay, everybody can go ahead and stand. They were talking about rivers of living water. Who is our living water? Jesus. Who is our living water? Jesus. Right. You guys ready to sing Deep Cries Out? Yeah. <laughs> well, at least yes, she's we honest. are. All right. You ready? Hold your mice close to your mouth. I've got a river of living water, fountain that never will run dry. It's an open heaven, releasing. We will never be denied. Get ready to stir. Cause I'm stirring up deep, deep well. Deep, deep waters, we're gonna dance in the river. Dance in the river. Serving up deep, deep well. Serving up deep, deep waters, we're gonna jump in the river. Jump in the river. Deep cries out to you. 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 Cry out to we cry out to you, Jesus. I got a river, living water, fountain that never will run dry. It's an open heaven, your releasing. We will never be denied. Cause we're stirring. Cause we're stirring up deep, deep wells. Stirring up deep, deep waters. We're gonna dance in the river. Dance in the river. Stirring up deep, deep wells. Stirring up deep, deep waters. We cry out to you, we cry out to you, we cry out to you, deep cries 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 out to you, we cry out to you, we cry out to you, Jesus, we're falling into deeper. Walking into deeper waters, 
I'll say hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, turn your page to build your kingdom. Yep. We already have it. No, we already have it. Okay. Nope, you gotta hold your mic. Everybody on build your kingdom. Build your kingdom here. Let the dark
fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire in this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we Everybody find I am free. Everybody get your mics up to your mouth. Mics up to your mouth. Ready? Everybody find happy day. Does everybody have happy day? Put your mics by your mouth. Ready? Turn around, Justice.
peace. Free at last, meeting face to face. I am yours, Jesus, you are mine. And this joy, perfect peace. Earthly pain finally will cease. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You wash my sin away. Oh, happy day, happy day. I'll never be the same. Everybody on the stage said amen. Can you guys say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Gently place your mics down. Gently, gently. Father, we just come to you right now, Lord. I thank you for the hearts of these children, Lord. I thank you for their passion um, that, that you've bestowed on them, Lord. I thank you that, that you're using them for your kingdom, Lord, and, and you're allowing them to, to do a work in this place, Lord. I would just pray for their hearts right now, Lord. I pray that you would um, just guide them, Lord, in, in all that they're doing, Lord, as we continue this service, God. Um, church, I, I, I ask that you would uh, just speak out your praises right now and, and allow us as a church family to, to pray with you. I begin to, to move into a a deeper part of worship. Lord, I pray that you would be with, with Jackson and, and Mitchell, Lord, as they, they bring the words that, that you've given them this week, Lord. And I just pray that you would just um, just allow them to, 
to find that confidence in you, God. And I pray that you would just speak through them, Lord. I pray that it wouldn't be their words that are up here, Lord. I pray that it would be you speaking through them, um, and you would allow us as a congregation to to really quiet our hearts and, and really feel that message that you've you've allowed them to to speak to us, Lord. I just praise you for for all you're doing in this youth, Lord, and all you're doing in this community, uh, and especially what you're doing in this congregation. And we just humble ourselves and we thank you for. Um, just using us to, to be your, your hands and your feet for that, for that kingdom, God. Uh, we just praise you in all, the, in all your glory. Uh, it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, earlier, probably yesterday, I was asked, what does communion mean to me? Um, and my answer was just kind of, you know, it's kind of quiet time. You get to pray afterwards, and you get grape juice. You remember Jesus and he died on how he died on the cross for us. So as I look deeper into it, I'm going to read the definition of communion. Um, communion is the sharing or exchanging of immediate, intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. Um, Um, in 1 Corinthians 11:28, it says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And I'm going to say this. So what, I have another verse to read, but what that meant to me was before we take communion, before we do any of that, we need to repent of our sins. And by doing that, we're saying, Jesus, I accept your gift. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, and I want that. I want to go to heaven, and I want that gift. Um, and the next verse is in Acts. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So, before you take communion and you repent of your sins, and that's your way of saying that you're accepting the greatest gift that anyone could have ever given us, that he died for us so that we could live with him. Um, and then after that, it's times of refreshing come, so you'll be blessed and you get to go to heaven and live that eternal life with Christ. You please pray with me. Dear Jesus, um, just thank you. Thank you again for your blessings and that you loved us that much that you would die for us and no nothing we can never be gifted anything greater than that and just thank you i could never thank you enough and i'm sure no one else ever could in jesus name amen
Okay. Oh, that's better. <clears throat> okay. So we've all grown up knowing the verse. I'm just going to read it right now. Uh, it's Exodus 23, verse 3 through 6, I believe. Yeah. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth, beneath, it or, beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. So we've all grown up thinking, you know, I don't worship, okay, I don't. It's, I don't have to worship a golden calf or a little statue. I can just check off that commandment along with murder, adultery, but you know, that's... But the one I want to focus on is that there are idol, idols that don't have to be uh, statues or totems. They can be anything that you put before God. And Paul talks uh, in Colossians about what, are, what th other things that are idols. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to you, to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So idolatry can be an idea. It can be, you know, lust. It can be drugs, alcohol. But it can also be things that actually you may think of as good. They can be family, money, friends, you know, phone. But they, it can also be like things like church. Whenever, once you think about it, yeah, you know, church, I'm worshiping God. But then you think, but if you're just focused on, you know, the ceremony, you know, looking your best, wondering how good the potluck's going to be after church, <laughs> you're not really focusing on God. You're focusing on how you look at, how you come before God, which, you know, is not worshiping God himself. So, let me open up my notes real quick. Uh, Yeah, so now, so now idol worship is not just, you know, something that happened long ago. It's, it can, it's actually one of the worst sins today. If anything, if anything, it can actually be the root of most sins. Because if you're not focusing on God, you're focusing on other things. Which when you focus on other things, it turns bad. If you focus on religion too much, you end up like Pharisees, and that did not end up well. And, man... And, what was I saying? Yeah, we end up worshiping the created, not the creator. And, well, we need to worship the creator. He created us. So, oh man, it's not going go longer than that. We need to focus on the living God, which Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. You've turned from dead idols. You've turned to the living God, which is what we want to do. We want to look at the living God. Which, you can't say, you say, well... Yeah, I love money and everything, which money can be good, but, you know. <laughs> but I love God. And, you know, they say, you cannot serve two masters. You can serve one master, but you, have to, but you, can, only, you can hate the other. So, oh, man. So which master do you choose? Do you choose earth, earthly things? You know, family, friends. Or do you choose God, the living God who created you, Amen. who sent a son to die? So, man, this is short. So, I'm just going to wrap up because I have nothing else. <laughs> uh, so my challenge for you is to look for those idols. They're, they can be easily hidden. You, don't, you think that, I don't have any idols, but you probably do. So I want you to look for those idols that you put before God. And I want you to pray about those idols and pray to God to get those, rid of those idols. I want you to lay them down before God, your creator. And by the way, for the fifth graders, taking notes, Jesus, God, power, holy, pray, love, worship, heaven, Father, Son, Spirit, Bible, faith, disciples, cross, grace, saved, forgiveness, amen, joy, and peace. You're welcome.
gosh, dude. Starting off pretty good, I guess. There's a lot of people here. It's kind of crazy. All right, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mitchell. I go to Hazeldale Church. Uh, I go to Marcus's youth group, wherever he's at, and I take Taekwondo here with Kirk, and that's me. So initially when Marcus asked me to preach here, I said no. I did not want to have any part of it whatsoever. It was not something I wanted to do. I don't like public speaking, not a big fan. Um, but then I went home that night, and God told me he wanted me to. And here I am today, and he got what he wanted. So... <laughs> I didn't really know what I was going to preach about until our Taekwondo test, and at Taekwondo we learn every month a piece of armor of God, and Kirk asked me what my favorite armor, piece of armor was, and mine is the sword of the spirit. It's really awesome. It is actually the word of God, and I'm just going to read you Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up your shield of faith, which, which you can extinguish the, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, so almost everyone has a Bible, and if you don't, you at least have access to one. We have so much power at the, fin or the ends of our fingertips, just with our phones or whatever, and we really take it as a privilege. Like, we take it as a right, but it's a privilege. There's 52 countries in this world that this is completely banned in. And if you read it or get caught reading it, they can kill you just on the spot for even having it. And some of us just go home and just put it in our dresser. But it's the Word of God, and we really have to study it and do what it says to know. And in Matthew... Matthew 4... Verses 1 through 11, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Then Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. So Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's not eaten anything. So the devil tempts him with food and tells him he can just turn these stones into bread and eat that. He tells him just to throw himself down because the angels will help him and they, he will not get harmed. And he also tells him he can have all the kingdoms of the world. But every single time this, that Satan tempts him, he comes back with scripture and like just counters all of Satan's temptations. And through this, we also see that Satan himself can kind of distort scripture and change what it says and it can be very confusing for all of us. And we really, like, we have to read this and study it a lot to understand if it's really God or Satan's plan and what he wants to do. And I would like to turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. It says, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as the angel of light. It is not surprising then, if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what they deserve. So Satan is not always the demon in the corner or whatever, tempting you and scaring everyone. He disguises himself as normal people or anything, that people that we trust. And he tries to get us to believe certain things that are not true. 
And we really have to study his word and know if it's God or him saying it. And it can be very hard and confusing. But if you just read this and really get to it and study it all the time, you'll know which one it was, if it was God or Satan really trying to get to you. He also does this in Genesis. Genesis 3 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan twisted God's word and confused Eve and caused her to have the first sin and then Adam. And they, if they would have just listened to God, it would have all been fine. But that's not our human nature. Our, we sin. That's what we do. And if we would just listen to God and do what he says, then we'd be so much better off. But we oftentimes don't do that. In James, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they'll be blessed in what they do. So reading your Bible is a good thing, but you have to live the life that it tells you to in it. Because that's really what it's for, is to show us how to live our life. And it's, it's really a blueprint of the way we should live, and we should mirror our lives after Jesus. But it's hard, I know. I'm human also. I make mistakes. But that's what we have to do, and that's what we strive, should strive to do, is to be more like Jesus in our everyday life. In closing, I think it's safe to say that none of you just go home and eat one meal a week and then just don't eat the rest of the week. We're American. We don't do that. We eat. <laughs> but that's what we do with the Word of God. We go to church one or two times a week, and that's all we do. We don't go home and read our Bibles as much as we should be or anything. And this is our, this is our food for our Christian life, and we have to use this every day to really get what it's telling us and to know what God has in store for us. And Jesus even said, like I said earlier, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. I would just really like to encourage everyone to just open up your Bible and read it throughout the week, and that's all I have. Thank you for having me.